And we are back, folks, for another edition of the Michigan Basketball Insider. Postseason style, just not the kind of postseason we expected. As the Wolverines embarked upon this season, we anticipated it to be another in a streak of NCAA tournament appearances. Uh, but it was all for naught as the Wolverines uh, wound up being bounced in the opening round of the Big Ten tournament. Uh, and that, in turn, with their regular season resume, was not enough to get them into the big dance. Joining me to reflect upon the season, the look ahead to the NIT matchup with Toledo is my friend and esteemed colleague. He was a star for Michigan basketball in the early 80s before going on to the NBA as a first-round draft pick. After spending a decade in the league, he has been one of the best basketball commentators in the land, whether it's with the Pistons or on the college basketball scene, where I think he did something like five games in six days or something like that. Tim, what was your schedule last week? Yeah, it was busy. I had the uh, the A Sun, which was Kennesaw State beating Liberty, and then I had um, an A ten game. Um, then I had the Pistons, and then I had uh, four A-10 games on Wednesday and Thursday and came home and did the Pistons. So it was it was nonstop. It was a lot of fun. And um, I got a chance to watch a lot of really good basketball. And I just kept walking away comparing it to Michigan and and how um, you know how how close they they were this year. Uh, little things make a big difference, and and in the end, they they were not a real good team. Um, we we could spin it any way we want, but they had some major flaws. Uh, I mean, I don't want to break on anybody, but I'm not afraid to say you know what I saw and what I thought about this this year's team, Sam. And I do think we've been spoiled. Five straight trips to the Sweet 16, a pipeline of NBA talent. Um, I think that in today's game, we're regarded as a blue blood based on what we've done. Um, I'm not upset with the season. I watched all year and thoroughly enjoyed the good and the bad and the confusing and the disappointment. Um, and there are no guarantees for sure. Think about Kentucky and North Carolina and Villanova. You know, some teams get in, some don't. Um, but I, I, I do think that the injury to Llewellyn Hurt, the youth, the defense, uh, and, and I also I, I want to start off with this. I listened to you know some talk radio and I looked at different comments on on social media. And you know when I hear that Juwan should be fired, I think it's the most idiotic comment that I've heard in a long time. There certainly needs to be roster upgrades. Transfer portal is going to be critical. The recruiting of Hunter and Jet and Kobe to stay is job number one. Um, and it needs to be a learning experience. I, I didn't think that that really anybody did a great job this year. Um, and, and so let, let's dive into it, Sam. Yeah. So, you know, you said something uh, that I think is a mouthful. You said that uh, job number one, recruiting job number one is recruiting the roster as, you know, Jet uh, you know, still has a first round grade. I don't know if he's still uh, being talked about in a lottery mentioned but likely a first round pick if he decides to come out kobe uh has been talked about more in that ilk uh, as far as the lower in the first round hunter you know i think that i think the consideration is different you talked about it all season you you could see the frustration with hunter he essentially had to grow up the team around him and that's a process i mean you you expect him to be a, a leader but at the at the same time i mean he's kind of like the old man in the club on the court with a bunch of young guys and so it can be frustrating for a guy like him it's one thing to lead but it's another thing to have to do a little bit of hand holding and i think he had to do that this year that's not to disrespect or disparage the guys around him but there are a lot of young mistakes made around him and so from a roster management standpoint, the part they can't do not anything about, that if you're Juwan, if you're the staff, you can't predict Jalen Llewellyn is going to be hurt, right? But the other pieces, when you talk about keeping your, your roster together, uh, there were there were some big voids that maybe some guys who got away, uh, who transferred, could have filled. The, the most notable of which is Brandon Johns at the four spot. He would have been a huge, huge huge void filler for them and i mean we talked a lot about frankie right it's it's obvious what frankie would have 
uh, meant to this team. But even even Zeb, who I think he would have got 11 minutes per game at VCU. Uh, so it's not like he played a huge role for them, but just to have some more size and athleticism in the backcourt would have meant leaps and bounds for this team, Tim. So uh, that's why when you talk about roster management, keeping uh, some of their own guys, they're going to be in that position with T. Will this year. There are going to be a lot of people who say, ah, T. Will didn't have a great season. Uh, he didn't live up to expectations this season. But T. Will in a different role on next year's roster could be really important, and I think it's a cautionary tale from last year. Well, I, I spoke to Brandon Johns and Zeb Jackson, uh, broadcast the VCU game. They're in the NCAA tournament, and and Brandon looks awesome. I mean, that guy is ripped. He's very athletic. He's in the best shape of his life, and he's playing a really key role as the starting center on an NCAA team. And I talked to Mike Rhodes. Um, he couldn't stop raving about Brandon Johns. He said, he's like a son to me. And that's unusual for a transfer player that was really only on the team for six months. Um, Mike Rhodes said that, that Zeb Jackson was a godsend that when Ace Baldwin went out, Zeb stepped right into the starting lineup and led them to victories as a point guard, unfamiliar position. And he said, Zeb Jackson is one of the top 10 athletes in the entire a10, which is an athletic conference. Um, those players, if they were embraced and and coveted and made to feel like, you know, we need you, they would have been here. And I told Brandon to his face, I said, if you don't leave Michigan, the Wolverines are in the tournament and it's not even a question. Like, I think he would have that kind of impact on this team. I think he would be better than Terrence Williams and Will Cheddar. I think he would have been better than what we saw to Musa last year. I mean, that's how far I think the Brandon Johns came. And the reason why I say it's a cautionary tale, there are a lot of people who looked at Brandon Johns last year and like, I mean, they won't miss him. You know, he, he, there were expectations heaped upon him heading into last year that admittedly he wasn't able to meet. Uh, but a lot of times it's about the role, the role that you put a guy in. Maybe he couldn't, fulfill the role of being at least at Michigan at that time. Maybe he wasn't ready to be frontline guy with, you know, expected to be team leader and make uh, huge leaps in, in contribution. But if you manage the role a little bit differently, I mean, in this year, it would have been the case where Hunter was, was clearly the team leader. So it, it wouldn't have been that expectation upon him. He would have had last year's experience under his belt. That's why I look at, at T. Will. I, I think that when you look at the volume, you know, I anticipated that with greater volume, he would be able to translate his production from last year into greater production. And that, that didn't necessarily take place. But in a, in a different role where maybe you aren't expecting that of him, Maybe he could fill that that role that he filled last year on a little bit broader basis. I think that's how you got to look at it as opposed to a lot of fans are saying, just get rid of him. A lot of fans are saying, just get rid of Brandon Johns and look at where they wound up now, which is why I say, you know, in this day and age of roster attrition, keeping guys in your system that can fill a role, maybe not a star role, is really important to him. And I, I think they'd be wise to, while you're looking at your your front three, you got to keep as much as the, of this roster together as you can. Well, uh, so so first of all, with Brandon Johns, I think that that part of the reason why he didn't put up more consistent numbers is that he wasn't put into a, a system that really fits him. And sometimes that's the way it, it happens. At VCU, there was very little structure. He just went out and he you know read, react, make athletic plays. And at Michigan, there was a lot of structure, and that's not his game. I, I liked what he did in the NCAA tournament last year when he just went out and and he he made plays. He was he was very aggressive. He was very strong. And so I would beg to differ a little bit on your comment about Terrence. Um, and like I don't say this disparaging at all, but the question that that I always ask when I'm considering if a player should, should come or go, like, let me ask it to you, Sam, how many teams in the big 10 would say, yeah, I want, I want Terrence Williams. I want Will Cheddar 
on my team. They can help me immediately. I, you know, I, I would have minutes for them. I would have a role for them. I think that's an important question that has to be asked about both of those players. You know, and and I, I think that there's a lot of support players on Michigan's team right now that clearly are are not ready to contribute at the Big Ten lineup. And so the, the question goes, and this is a tough one, you know, th- this is this is not basketball, um, college basketball from 20 years ago. Like if you can't help your team, you're going to get asked to move on and you're going to get replaced. And so those are some of the questions that I think have to be asked about the guys on the bench. Yeah, I, look, I agree. If you're asking, first of all, if you're making that assessment based purely upon this year, that's number one. Of course, mm-hmm. you look at him this year and you say, well, what role can he really fill? Coming off of last year, though, I think it was pretty obvious that he could be a positive contributor to the team. But imagine we had applied that same scrutiny to Zeb because it wasn't like there weren't a lot of teams beating down Zeb Jackson's door right. after last year. Right. But he he goes to, to VCU. He has more experience under his belt. He's given more leash to to run. And so that that's why I say, look. Experience can sometimes be the best teacher. Experience from the standpoint of the player and experience for the coach when it comes to how to use the player. What what role is he is he most successful in? The role they tried to put Terrence in this year, not the best role for him. Maybe something in between, maybe something more like what you expected him to be. So if you were saying, come off the bench, Terrence, we want you to, to rebound, to, to not be expected to put up five or six, three, four or five, four to six threes a game. Maybe you take a couple a game, right? And it's not that pressure on you to be that score. Maybe he can be that guy. Go out and get you a four in the portal that you expect to be the starter. But if you find yourself recycling all the time, that's what we just, that's what we just saw them do. Right. Imagine if they, like I said, if they applied that scrutiny to Zeb and, and now he's out the door. Imagine if they hadn't and he had come back, he would have really helped this team. Right. And and um, I'm not I'm not saying that 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 Terrence should not come back because that's the one thing that Michigan needs are some veteran players on this team, some leaders and some guys that have been through it. I'm just saying at the power forward position, Michigan must find some productivity. They have to because Baker and Williams and Cheddar, they they were going to combine for between five and ten points a game. And that was a big detriment and it makes life a lot harder on Hunter too. You know, if you can get that, that face up for to knock down threes and help out on the boards a little bit, I think that would be something that has to be a priority in the portal. I agree. Uh, What I hope, and I may have mentioned this before, look, it took Michigan football a couple of cycles to kind of get into a portal groove, right? They, they got some contributors, uh, over the past couple, but nothing like what we just saw this past year. Michigan was football was one of the clear portal winners. And so I think there are a couple of factors that go into that. One is you get a, an idea of what you can really get into school here, right? What, what aspect of the portal do you, do you hit? You can't hit upperclassmen because not enough of their, their credit, their credits will transfer, right? That's, that's number one. Number two, another factor is there's just more talent in the portal now, too. So there's a broader or deeper pool of of prospects to draw from. Between those two factors, Michigan football was able to go out and really fill a lot of holes. And Tim, Michigan basketball will be charged with doing much the same thing. You just hope they don't have to go filling the roles of those top three guys, too. Right. Well, you're exactly right, Sam. And the, the the challenge is that, and we don't see these guys on a regular basis, um, but Michigan desperately needed depth and, and they didn't have a chance to play, you know, a lot of guys that we would have liked to have seen. So, you know, who is Isaiah Barnes? He's a six, seven guard, a wing, you know, wh- whatever. He's a swing man. And he had no role with this team. And Yusef Hyatt, you know, wasn't ready to go. I think he's got great upside. Um, but, you know, what about Greg Glenn? 6'7", 230. He's built like a power forward. And if he would have been able to get into the competition at the power forward, 
You know, I, I think that it would have been great to give him a chance. Um, you know, Jace knows his role. He's an asset. He's a leader. But I'm going to say the same thing um, that, that somebody told me when I was coaching my son that one of the hardest things in coaching is to coach your kid. And unless he's the best player on the team or the worst player on the team, it, it's set up to fail because it, it just causes problems. You love your kid. It's hard to coach them and yell at them and, and not have it affect the relationship a little bit. Um, and, and, and so there's just a ton of really challenging conversations that are yeah. going to have to happen about the support guys. Yeah, uh, you know, so a couple of things, man. I, I feel like we saw Isaiah Burns. I feel like we saw him. Um, didn't see what did him you think? Well, so what did you think? I felt like he wasn't ready. Right. I felt like he wasn't ready. And so is that is that a, a system fit thing? Is that a, a coaching thing? I mean, that that's something that they'll they'll have to determine as far as what can they get out of him here what kind of role can they find for him here it, it, it may be some you know development isn't a straight line for for every single guy right and so you know maybe two years wasn't enough to get him to the point from a not a athletic standpoint clearly he's there athletically but what did phil talk about when he came in he was talking about basketball iq and he said hey you know you got to be you got to be from a i'm trying to remember the exact phrasing that he used, but he says, you know, you got to be a high IQ player to be able to get in, in, in the lineup, in a rotation here. So what I took from that is, you know, they got a lot of basketball, not athleticism to put into him, but a lot of basketball or scheme knowledge to put into him, and just wasn't quite there yet. So I, I didn't feel like more minutes for him would have been answered. I don't know enough about Greg Glenn in, in practice to be able to say, I feel like they got to be active in the portal. You, you got to yeah. find some guys in the portal that can come in, give you some athleticism and some some shooting, some some Terrence Shannon. I mean, Terrence Shannon was a guy that they had ready to go. They couldn't get him in school without losing a lot of credits, which is why I said, you know, figuring out what you can get in. They, they aren't going to be able to get the upperclassmen in. That's just unless they're a grad transfer. You can't get junior and beyond in at Michigan. They just unless that guy is willing to lose a number of credits like Shea Patterson was. Shea yeah. Patterson lost 20 plus credits in his transfer from Ole Miss, right? So unless you're get you're getting a guy who's willing to do that, Tim, you're gonna be up a you're gonna be up a creek chasing upperclassmen. You got it gotta has to be sophomore and below. And I think they're gonna be more of those guys in the portal this year. Yeah, and the the other thing I was wondering if you're talking about those players that I mentioned that that didn't get any run for a team that needed some depth, the, the you know the questions are how's the player evaluation and how is the player development? You know, are, are the guys getting better or are they more of a, a, a mid major type of talent level? Um, those are hard questions to ask. And once again, I'd have a better idea if I was at practice every day. And I, I, I know Juwan and Phil and, and, you know, all the coaches, they, they could answer this without question. But to me, if, if you need a player and we don't see him, it tells me he's not ready to go. And so th there you go. If you want to hit the portal hard, some guys are going to have to leave. And I, I don't, I don't like that conversation. I would hate that as a coach because, you know, you, you've, you've embraced them. You put all this time in and you know how much it would hurt to, to be told to go somewhere else, but there's also opportunity other places too. Yeah. Uh, it's, I think it's a, look, it's part of college, college athletics now to on a yearly basis, you're talking to your players about how you fit in, where you are in a developmental curve. And is it, do you, do you see it on the horizon having a bigger role than you have now? I mean, that's that's every coach, that's every program. And you got to do it not just with your rotation guys, but obviously with the guys outside of your rotation. And those guys often are going to look around. Some guys are going to be content uh, to to just, you know, not toil, but to, to continue to, to work at it in hopes of, 
not only getting their degree at their current institution, but of eventually contributing maybe in their in their last year or so. I don't know what the thought process is with the guys outside of the rotation at Michigan. What I do know is no matter the year, no matter your roster situation, you you go in expecting to be active in the portal because attrition, you have to expect not even when you don't know when it's where it's going to come from. Someone's going to transfer. So let's let's just start there. Hmm. On every roster in the country, someone's going to transfer. And because you know someone's going to transfer, you don't know who that is, you got to be ready to pounce in the portal to add a guy in. And so what do you need? Michigan needs some greater contribution at the four spot. They need some more shooting, and they definitely need some defense. So that's what you go shopping for in the portal, and you got to be doing it either with grad transfers or underclassmen. You can't do it with juniors and seniors. Yeah, I um, I would imagine somewhere in Juwan's office, there's a list of about 25 or 30 power forwards around the country, and they've watched film, and they they know who they are, and they're going to hit it hard. Um, the, the other position is point guard, and I'm really intrigued. What what's going to happen with Jalen Llewellyn? I, I bet that yeah. he, I bet he wants to come back and finish the job that he wasn't able to complete. Um, I think that they still need another point guard to have three on this roster. And, and I'd love to see Jalen play some backup to Kobe. I think he could do that. He may not be quite as quick coming off an ACL. Um, maybe that's a role that would fit him. But, yeah, but... It's, you, you talk about hard conversations, that's one. That's a very hard conversation. Because I look at that as a, as a, a little bit different scenario, a lot different scenario than a guy like Terrence Williams who's who's been in the program on the court for for 3 years so you've you've invested a lot of even if it's not contribution in the role that you had envisioned heading into the year you can see him really feel filling a leadership role on this team from his time on task yeah. he knows he knows the program in and out he's been through the wars at this level it's hard to really say what Jalen Llewellyn is I'm not saying that Jalen Llewellyn can't do it, but we had a small sample space of what he could bring to the table. And so if I'm looking at my roster and looking at the portal and you got a sample space from Jalen Llewellyn already, I'm not saying that it's a non-starter bringing him back, but I'm saying that I'm at least looking around to see if I ha- if I can find an athletic you know, an athletic uh, compliment to Dougie, right, at at that spot. Again, that's not ruling him out. I'm just saying I'm not going into the offseason saying I know for sure that's going to be a a piece that I bring back in the puzzle. Agreed, agreed. And Jalen might embrace, you know, a a look as the third guard in a three-guard lineup. Um, He he may – he also knows that things happen. There's foul trouble and injuries. And and, and so I, I still think there's a good possibility he comes back. Yeah, I, I would want to see what's the what combos do you have in the portal? Because you remember, you got George Washington coming in. I think George Washington, I like him a lot. I think he's going to be able to to bring shooting to the fold. I think that he he's a high IQ player. He's the son of a coach like that's a freshman. Is Look, I know we talk a lot about the youth of this team. Uh, the problem is they had too much of it. But, you know, to expect a freshman to come in and play a meaningful role isn't a bridge too far. It's just like when you're ask, asking three or four young guys to to be major contributors, that's where you roll, run into trouble unless it's like, you know, unless it's an elite class. But George Washington is a guy that I think could come in as a freshman and fill a backup role. Can you go out and find you some – a guy who can guard three positions, a guy who can finish on the break, a guy who can finish through contact, a guy who can bring you some some leadership as well. Again, I'm not ruling Jay Lou well and out. I want to be clear about that. But I'm going shopping. I'm going looking around to see if I can add some more athleticism to this puzzle in the portal before I make the decision that that's definitely going to be the case. Because I tell you what, as much as we talked about development, Tim, 
Kobe, we saw some development in Kobe. Kobe Bufkin developed a great deal over last year. They did a really good job with Kobe. And over the course of the year, Doug McDaniel developed. We saw a lot of development in Doug McDaniel. So we saw it in some pockets and obviously didn't see it in others, others being most notably the four spot. So, so I've thought throughout the year that we should be thanking God above that, that Doug and Kobe and Hunter and Terrace had injury free years like that. That could have really been a problem. What would they have done if Kobe would have sprained his ankle and missed two weeks? Um, you know, what, what if, what if Doug got a concussion or, or had COVID or what, whatever, I mean, the fact that those three, those three and four guys were so healthy made this year a lot more tolerable. Um, and I do think that there was improvement made. I, I love the, 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 the improvement in post-passing to Hunter, having patience. You know, I always believe that a postman needs between three and five seconds to be able to, to fight his way. And the defense isn't going to be able to, to three-quarter – front him for for you know for five seconds and and so i thought that they did a better job of that i thought that defensively keeping their man in front of them was really impressive by kobe and doug and it was it got to be pretty consistent and terrace reed did a lot of really positive things and so you know there's a core there and i see a a, a real simple path of Michigan being able to be a top three team in the Big Ten next year, I, I really do. I'm not. I'm not jumping ship. I'm not upset about it. I. I um. I see a path, Sam. Yeah. Look, I, I think, like you said, it's a tough. We're having the tough conversation. Uh, but Terrace <laughs> is another one who we saw develop over the course of the year. So again, while we folk, it, it's obvious that they fell short at, at the four spot more than anything else. But if the guys who we saw be good examples of development, continue in that development, and in Kobe's case, come back. I agree with you, Tim, because what about Terrace Reed next year? I mean, I felt like, you know, as much as they were better with Terrace on the court when they had Hunter, when Hunter and Terrace playing together, they couldn't always do it because he's also Hunter's primary backup. Right, which is why you need another reason why you need to go out and get a, a another four or a four or five that will allow you to do that more, right? So big, big deal. But I, I think your point about Terrace is one to to highlight as well. He he's a guy who flashed some real potential this year. Yeah. And for anybody that's out there saying, gosh, you guys are cold, you know, these guys wear amazing blue. They love the school. they they, you know, they embrace Juwan. Look. I mean, I've been told plenty of times, you know, you're not good enough or we need to go in a different direction. You're traded. And and so maybe that makes you callous, but, but that's, that's the reality of sports nowadays. And so, you know, I, I, I'd love to see everybody come back, but I, I want to see them win and I want to see them grow. And that's the challenge of sports now. Uh, well, they, they definitely have some roster improvements uh, to make, and it's not it's not all going to happen in in recruiting. So uh, and like I said, I mean, you, you start with they're going to be there's going to be attrition, even if all the guys come back uh, and decide to go one more time. Every roster in the country is it's 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 unbelievable when you don't have a transfer in this day and age. So you got to yeah. expect to you got to expect to have one. And uh, then as far as the guys coming back, you know, there's some real lessons to take away from from this season when it comes to commitment on the defensive end of the floor. You could see Kobe's commitment in the offseason to defense. Right. Yeah. And So uh, both individually and collectively, they're going to have to what Kobe did in the offseason last year. I mean, that's what I expect from Jet. Like, you know, people who write Jet off, oh, he, he doesn't play defense. Imagine if you had written Kobe off in the same way. Now, I'm not saying it's just going to be the same, the kind of defender that Kobe is. I'm not saying that. But I think he showed in spots that he could be better than he showed himself to be earlier in the season. So that's the kind of maturation if he comes back you want to see. But it's not just him because 
Tim, when you were when we're watching them and they are trying to come back against Rutgers and there's a free throw and no one boxes out. No one boxes out. I mean, they were pointing at Jet, and yeah, sure, he could have. I'm talking about the, a lot of the fans pointing at Jet, fine. But I saw three other players who didn't box out too. So that's a them thing. That's not just an individual thing. That's the kind of thing where it felt like guys that maybe were maybe hanging their head a little bit, maybe they got a little down on themselves. That's the kind of mental resilience that they're going to have to build a callus from, to use your word, from this past year and apply it moving forward, that that can never be shaken. Defense can never be shaken. Boxing out can't have a Wisconsin-like performance. And you can't have, when you're trying to come back in a, in a game where everything is on the line, where a guy rebounds a free throw with no, with no obstacle in front of him and lays it in. You can't have that. I wasn't going to bring this up, but you did. <laughs> so, um, you know, the three losses to end the season, I, I really thought that I saw that the team lacks cohesiveness and chemistry. Um, and they're really nice guys. I just don't think they get along great on the court. And, and I think that anybody that's listening to this podcast played sports at some point. I mean, that's what this is. It's a basketball podcast. And, and you know, at the end of years, you, you played with some guys who just didn't blend in well. And, and I don't think this team did. On the, the no box out free throw, um, I said right then and there, and, and I know it's true that, and I've been watching Michigan basketball since 1979. That's probably the worst basketball player play. I'm sorry, the, the worst basketball play that I've ever seen. Um, and it's all the players. Jet will get blamed for it, but it's about communication. And I was thinking back when I was in fourth grade, my first coach, one of the first things he told us on free throws, you yell, who's got shooter, right? You, you know that, Sam. Who's got shooter? I mean, that's just something you yell. And, and because I learned that in fourth grade, I yelled it 100 times to Dr. J. You know, who's got shooter, Doc? Who's got him? Uh, I asked Dominique Wilkins and, and I told Doc Rivers, who's got shooter? That's just like, that's what you just do. You communicate. Nobody said anything. And, and I know it's just two points, but it's a super close game and little things make a big difference. And to me, that's nothing more than, than communication. No, nobody said anything. Yeah. When they were at best, their, their best defensively this season or on the class, it was when the communication was at, at a high level. I remember commenting on it at times in this podcast. See, I, I guess I differ with my opinion on, on the why. I don't think it's that. They don't like each other. Or, no, I don't either. Yeah, you I, like, you, you said they different. Yeah, you, you said right. they weren't cohesive on the court. I think you had a bunch of guys who, um, at that point in the game, adversity had really hit, right? And shots weren't falling. And while you expect them to, to really mature to a point where that doesn't affect other aspects of their game, you know, when – when adversity hits, it, it kind of exposes your flaws. Uh, uh, it brings your flaws to the surface. And for this team, I think it's that even though we had seen them in a spot of the season, respond to adversity in a resounding fashion. Three games in a row, right? But they lost three. Uh, they, they lost a uh, couple of overtime games. And then you get in this game, and... You, you you feel like you're you're running them and then they come back and they put they're putting it on you things are going to things aren't going your way and you start to hang your head and they start to hang their head collectively and it wasn't there wasn't a guy who stepped up in that moment to say hey guys let's let's get it together to to be that that uh that rallying cry that you need to have on a team i felt like they were sulking i felt like they were feeling sorry for themselves so I, I don't know if that's the same thing as saying they, they weren't cohesive, but that's what I saw, a team feeling sorry for itself in the moment. And when, you're, when that's what you're, you're focused on, when you're hanging your head, it, the, the fundamentals kind of go away. And the fundamentals I hear you. I moment. hear you, Sam. I, I, I know what you're saying. I, I get it. So I, That's it. <laughs> yeah, but, but hey, but you know what? Sometimes experience is the best teacher. 
I, I remember talking to Juwan after one of the games in the press conference. I said, man, normally I hear you. I hear you all the time, but I'm starting to hear the team. Well, just like you just said to him, in that game, you weren't hearing the team. You weren't hearing the team. So this is a lesson that you, you thought they had learned earlier in the season that obviously they didn't, and maybe this was this is a teacher, and this is another reason why playing more games. I know a lot of fans say, well, this is embarrassing to play in the NIT. Assuming that this team comes back, this is where it could really benefit them to play more games, to be able to take, try to take some lessons from the season. You remember what, what happened after that Wisconsin game? And they came out, they looked like a different team the next game because clearly the coaches had got on them about that. I imagine the same thing happened after this free throw incident in that game against Rutgers. Yeah, you're right. That'll never happen. And I am, um, you know, I'm disappointed in, in the, the, the Michigan basketball finish, but I'm not shocked. And, and I think that I shared with you on December 29th, I sat in the stands against central Michigan. And I said to my friend that was with me, I said, you know, just watching this team, um, I don't think they're going to play in the NCAA tournament this year. And they, they had just, you know, lost to uh, Central Michigan. They lost or they almost lost to Ohio in OT. They struggled in EMU. Um, but I just, you know, I, I think there were issues with the roster and they had one point guard and th there was just a lot of stuff going on. So, you know, I don't think we can be surprised, but I think this can be a catalyst to get better. I remember you coming on after that. And you said this is not a this team will not make the NCAA tournament. I hate that that prediction was right, but you did say it. So yeah, got to give you credit for that, which brings us to to the look ahead. Before we get to talking about the game, real hey, quick. can I say one other thing, Sam? Sure. I have a guess. I want to hear your guess. Hunter, yeah, Jet, Kobe. Who goes? Who stays? <sighs> so this is this is the glass half full perspective. Um, it, it's coming from a bad outcome, but I think you, if you're Kobe and Jet, you can look at that last game and, and see the places in which you can really improve your game. I I watch Kobe in that last game. It's like, man, I I just want to see him be more aggressive in that moment because I felt like by the end of the season, Hunter's the best player. Make no mistake, I felt like Kobe was one B. I, I really did. I, I felt like the energy that they put into getting Hunter shots, that that's where they need to be with Kobe. But you you also got to be demanding that too. Like you you say, Tim, all the time, if you're a big fella, you got to be demanding the ball. A lot of times the coaches, okay, do you look like you want it in that moment, right? So I, I don't know what they felt, how they felt in the moment. My point is, I feel like Kobe coming back another year can be that guy for the full season. And then Jet, if he were to come back, that defensive improvement that we saw Kobe, relatively speaking, like I don't think he'll be the, Kobe, the defender that Kobe is, but he could be a much better defender than we saw him be. He could be much more offensively than just a shooter. Jack can put it on the floor. He can continue to refine that part of the game. And the reason why that's important, and you talk about this all the time, Tim, are you going to just are you going to be a first round pick? That's great, but are you going to stick? Everyone talks about the second contract. But what if you don't stick, DJ Wilson? What happens if you don't stick, Caleb Houston? Right? Well, the second contract is moot. It's null and void. So do you put yourself in a better position to be a first-round draft pick and to stick if you come back? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to roll the dice, Tim, and say they come back. And if they come back, Hunter comes back. If those two don't come back, I don't think Hunter comes back because if you're Hunter Dickinson, even if you don't go to the NBA, do you want to come back and grow another team up? I think his answer to that question will be no. Yeah, good answer. Good answer. Who stays, who goes? Um, Hunter will stay. Kobe will stay. And now I'm not going to say Jets leaving, um, but I will say this. I am, um, and, and I have not talked to anybody on the inside. I've, I've, this is just a, a thought. Jet reminds me of Caleb and Musa last year. And I just think some guys are excited to get to the league 
and get paid and live the life and chase their dream and play against their heroes. And, and I think a lot of that is Jet. And I can see some really hard conversations because Juwan is on top of it. He's sharp. His wife is really sharp. And I think they both know what's best for their son. But I also think it's hard to coach your son. And I think Jet is going to get drafted. I think he's going to get drafted high. Um, his specialty is shooting. And NBA teams will have him in and do shooting drills. And they'll measure him and they'll say, wow, he's got great size. And they're going to interview him and he's going to sound so smart and articulate. And he's going to be a top 20 pick. And I don't think he's ready and I think he'll struggle. But, but Sam, I'm just saying don't be surprised if he leaves because I, yeah. I think I think I think that that's a guy that's got an NBA future and people are going they're they're going to see his strengths and say we can fix his weaknesses. I, I could see that. I look I never saw Caleb at any point in his freshman season look like we saw Jet look at spots this year. So I I I, I just think uh he has a better chance of sticking than Caleb. I think he's a better shooter than Caleb. I think he put, better. He, he puts it on the floor better than Caleb. Um, and, and I think he has the potential, potential to be a better defender than Caleb, too. I just think he's better all around than, than Caleb. But again, I get back to the point that I think will be discussed. Like what I was what I in talking to different people, talking to different scouts, they all say, coach a son or not, you're a lottery pick, you go. Right, that, that's like conventional wisdom. But I don't hear the, the, the talk, and you talk to scouts more than me, but I talked to a few scouts here in the past couple of weeks, mo mostly about Kobe, and they were talking about how much they are falling in love with, with Kobe. I don't hear as much lottery talk with, with Jet. So if you aren't a lottery guy right now and you can improve your, your stock tangibly, to the point where you are a lottery guy and getting back to the point you bring up sticking tim you you are the champion of getting to the league and staying there can you get to the league and make it to the second contract you give yourself a better shot if you show that there's more diversity in your game that you aren't just a shooter because i think right now if a if a team drafted jet shooter that's what they're saying shooter which there's a you need those in the nba but Jet can be more than that. I'm convinced Jet Howard can be more than that, and he could get closer to being more than that if he comes back another year. Yeah, I, I, I think he should come back. And but sometimes a player that comes from a certain system helps somebody's draft status. And I think that there's a lot of people that will see Jordan Poole and say Jet Howard's going to be like him. He's just such a beautiful shooter. Um, and, and that's why I think that when Jet, Jet's, Jet's going to walk into a team's workout and he's going to excel. He, he, he's got the ability to do all the things in those workouts that teams love. So, All right, well, we need to, we need to uh, break down this game. I will say this. You know, he has that kind of J, – JP wound up in a perfect system. He wound mm -hmm. up in a place where, you know, shot selection isn't really frowned upon. Like you can really shoot anything, and it was a it was a winning franchise with hall a couple of hall of famers on it, right? I mean, it's just, you couldn't have landed in a better spot. But cautionary tale is some of the other guys who didn't land in ideal situations uh, relative to their development. And so, I mean, do you do you really want to roll the dice when you didn't have to? And one of the reasons why JP left was he felt like even if I don't get drafted in the first round, I'd rather get paid to develop than come back and play for John Beeline another year. That's that's how he felt. I think that's one of the reasons why John Beeline is like, man, the hell with this college thing. Like, this dude doesn't even want to come back. It wound up work, working out for all sides. Not John coaching in the NBA, but he's with the Pistons now. You know what I mean. But Jet's not like that. He, he be coming back to play for his dad. Tell me about Toledo, Tim, real quick. So Toledo won – 17 straight this year. They had a poor game against Kent State. Those were definitely the best two MAC teams. Um, I think Toledo's the favorite tomorrow against Michigan and Chrysler. I, I really do. I, I see Michigan as an underdog. Um, Toledo is excellent. They're high scoring. 
Um, they're deep. They're talented. They're really angry because they didn't go to the NCAA. They're going to be focused and excited to beat Michigan. They, they're just down the road. So, you know, they live in the shadow. Michigan struggled to beat Eastern, squeaked by in overtime against Ohio, lost to the Chips. Um, in five games against those three teams, uh, th this Toledo team won by 59 points. So, so they're, they're really good. They've got four that average double figures, high scoring. They score around 86. They've got great guards. They drive. They finish. Sam, they shoot 40% as a team from three. So I'll be really surprised and impressed if Michigan um, respects Toledo. I, I I don't think that that they're feeling really good about any game that doesn't say NCAA. I mean, they the guys in the program have seen nothing but NCAA success. So I, I mean, I don't I don't want to come off as negative, but I'm just saying from my heart, I I think Toledo is a really good team. Um, I, I think that I think it's going to be a tough game. What do you think? Uh, look, uh, if they come out with that mentality, yeah. I mean, it, it, look, Toledo, give them some respect. They're one of the highest scoring teams out there. But if they come out with the mindset that you just laid out, yeah, you'll get they'll get beat. I mean, like you said, they they lost to Central Michigan. But you play for pride, you play for each other. I mean, it's not about it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about the fans. It's about the the guy next to you, especially if you plan on coming back. Or they, I, maybe they don't know, but especially if it's a possibility that you come back. I mean, you, you need to be working towards something. You need to 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 rebound, to use that pun from last game, and and show that that's not you, not boxing out on a, on a rebound, right? Show some improvement from that. Use show a springboard into next year. You know, show some some the, the Kobe that we saw before that game. Because whatever happened, it just wasn't the same kind of aggression. Let's see him return, revert to that. Let's see them get him more involved from the beginning of the game, right? Uh, and, and the same thing with, with Jet. Those, those two guys seem like passengers to me in that game against Rutgers. Where, and expecting Hunter, I, and this was just the whole team, expecting Hunter to do everything. And to Hunter's credit, hell, hell he, he did everything he could in that game for the most part. Yeah. Those other guys need to rise back to the fore in this game, play for pride, play for one another, and play maybe, possibly, for next year as well. So um, let's go back to 1984. Um, last day of the season, we were playing Northwestern, and we were tied for third in the Big Ten. That's pretty good. Tied for third in the Big Ten. That's with Indiana and Iowa and Illinois and Michigan State. I mean, those are all really good teams. We're tied for third. Um, we lose in overtime by one to Northwestern. I still think we're going to the NCAA. I'll, it was a gut punch when I found out that we weren't. Um, our coaches did a great job. And as a senior leader, I think I did a really good job of getting our guys excited about the possibilities that exist. And we uh, we went on a roll. We beat Wichita State with Xavier McDaniel and Antoine Carr and those guys. We beat Marquette. We beat Dayton. We beat Virginia Tech with Del Curry. And then to beat Notre Dame in Madison Square Garden was amazing. And so there's a lot to play for. And I just hope that the guys get excited about another chance to play college basketball for the University of Michigan. It's a home game. I think it'll be a really good crowd. Man, be excited about this opportunity, and, well, and I hope before, they do. Before you go, Tim, because can you can you just take us back in real quick? Because you said it's a gut punch at the end of the season. This squad, when they lost to Rutgers, no one's expecting to go to the NCAA tournament, right? You were still expecting to go to the NCAA tournament. How how did you guys compartmentalize? How did you set that aside and play for the what they call? The not invited tournament. I'm sure you've heard that before. How do you get in the right headspace in order to go out and put your best foot forward in this tournament? So I I um I was really down and I had a friend of mine that told me to quit whining. And he said, You you know, you you you're playing college basketball. You've got so much potential in the future. You're you're just you're just being a baby, you know, grow up, act right. And I did a lot of thinking about it and 
that that um that night I went to the um, CCRB on campus and I I took a ball and I just started shooting and I ran sprints and um I I got there for practice the next day and I ran sprints again and when my teammates came in my my shirt was soaking wet and and I think it sent a message that that I was taking this really serious and we had great practices and we we started playing the best ball of the year. And I think a lot of teams in the NIT, they don't want to be there. They're mad that they're not in the NCAA. They want to go on spring break. That you know, there's a lot of things. So it's all about your senior leaders. If they get the team ready to go, they'll they they can win this thing. There's no doubt, but they could also get beat by Toledo. All right, great stuff. We will be back next week. Whatever happens, we'll be back to talk about it, right? We have the tough conversations too um, to uh, on, a, on a season that was really disappointing. Maybe they can finish on a much more positive note. And so we look forward to talking about that next week here on the Michigan Basketball Insider. If you like this podcast, be sure to rate it. Be sure to review it. Be sure to tell all your friends about it. They can find it wherever they get their podcasts. If you watch us on YouTube, like the video, subscribe to the channel. That way you get a notification every time we do a new one. And, of course, over on the MichiganInsider.com is where it all goes down, football, basketball, and recruiting and in the heart of spring practice. This is the time for you to get in. When you become a full-paying member, you'll also get access to Paramount+. Plus. That'll do it for us here on the Michigan Basketball. Look at that guy holding up that, holding up that basketball, the NIT Championship 1984. That's how you end on a positive note right there. Appreciate that, Tim. Go blue, Sam. We'll see you next week on the Michigan Basketball Insider.